Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Freehold. We are so glad you could be with us this morning. I will repeat the same announcement that I have been making for a while. Uh, we will have a congregational meeting in person after worship next Sunday. We are returning to in-person worship every Sunday, starting this Sunday. But of course, if you cannot physically be here, then you are probably watching this right now. So um, please join me in the call to worship. Let us worship God, our light and our salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. We desire to live in God's house and to seek God in his holy temple. We have come with shouts of joy to sing and to make music to the Lord. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Teach us your ways and make straight our paths in this hour of worship and offerings. <laughs>
please hear the call to confession. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now, as we have been reconciled to God, let us also be reconciled to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple, and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased the strength of my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Our second reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians, starting in chapter 4, verse 13, and concluding in chapter 5, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes to the community at Corinth. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but 
at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I have often said that the single best part of this job of being a pastor is that I get to baptize babies. Celebrating the sacrament of baptism is the most joyful part of this calling. Ministry has its highs and its lows, but even in those times when I'm tired or frustrated, I remember that I am charged with this wonderful task. I remember that part of my call to ministry is to welcome our children into the faith. First of all, I get to share in the joy of the parents. And let me tell you, even when that baby is a couple's third child, like Adeline Claire Plahutnik or Aidan John Capillary, the parents are joyful, excited, and happy. I love the chance to connect with the family and build a relationship. But it's not just the baby's family. Everyone in the congregation is full of joy when we celebrate a baptism. The joy is infectious. It's a reminder that this community is alive, that there are new people coming in, and we have a duty to raise that child in the faith, support the parents, and conserve the resources we have so that we may continue to thrive as a congregation. Simply put, when we celebrate a baptism, it's a day of joy and hope for everyone. No one complains about anything when we celebrate the sacrament. I don't hear any complaints about the sermon or the hymns. No one is upset if we run longer than an hour. When we celebrate a baptism, we celebrate what unites us. We celebrate what we hold in common. Our reading this morning comes from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the congregation in Corinth. The Corinthian congregation was anything but united. This was a big problem, and it seems that many people in the congregation didn't want to listen to Paul. You have to understand, Paul was one of the people who founded the congregation. He was there at the beginning, yet some rejected him. Well, I think many of you are familiar with the story of the Apostle Paul. Some historical context might be helpful. Paul was originally named Saul. He was born Jewish. He was trained in the law and was from a city called Tarsus, which is located in present-day Turkey. Jesus was crucified and resurrected in the year 30 CE, most likely. Almost immediately after the resurrection, the first Christian community is formed in Jerusalem, but nobody is using the name Christian at that time. The followers of Jesus all think of themselves as faithful Jews at first. This brought them into conflict with the Jewish religious authorities. There were many clashes between these authorities and the early Jewish Christian communities. In fact, one of the chief persecutors of those early believers was Saul of Tarsus. And he was quite good at it. Until one day, while he was on the road to Damascus, Saul was struck by a blinding flash of light. He saw a vision of the resurrected Jesus who said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? After seeing this vision and being struck blind, 
Saul had a change of heart. When he regained his sight, he was born anew and renamed Paul. He took his charge directly from Jesus. He was called to be an apostle. That is, Paul was called to spread the word of the risen Christ. This was probably somewhere between the years 31 and 35 CE. Eventually, Paul goes to Jerusalem. The early church is spreading rapidly among Jewish communities across the Roman Empire. The leaders of the church in Jerusalem decided that they also needed to undertake a mission to Gentile communities and establish new congregations there too. Paul was one of the leaders of that mission. Paul spends the rest of the 30s and all of the 40s establishing these communities. He likely visited Corinth, which is not far from the city of Athens, and established the congregation there between the years 47 and 49. Later, he went to Ephesus, which is in present-day Turkey. Paul continues to correspond with the Corinthians even after he's gone on to his next mission. It turns out there was a lot of conflict in Corinth after Paul left. Other people came into the community calling themselves apostles. We don't know who they were, but a lot of people wanted to follow their teaching. Some even question Paul's authority as an apostle. We don't see all of that in this passage from 2 Corinthians, but I encourage you to read the whole letter sometime. You'll find more of the conflict. In this reading today, the apostle Paul reasserts his authority as an apostle by returning the discussion to the theology that all Christians hold in common. As he says in verse 14, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. That is, they are all united in the resurrection and the possibility of life everlasting in Jesus Christ. To drive his point home, Paul reminds the Corinthians how he and other true apostles have suffered to share this message with the world. Yet, they have not lost heart because of their momentary afflictions. Paul and the other true apostles have learned to look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Paul's goal is to unite the believers in Corinth and to remind them that they have not yet experienced the fullness of Christian community and the resurrection life. He's reminding them that they're new believers. Yes, They've experienced the movement of the Holy Spirit, but they need to learn how to talk to people who haven't felt the same movement. They also need to care more deeply for the members of their own community, too. They need to demonstrate it to the world by living like Jesus did. In this community, in First Presbyterian Church, we are not afflicted by the deep divisions that the congregation at Corinth experienced. But we do live in a world that has grown increasingly indifferent to much of what we offer. And certainly it's a world that doesn't speak our language. The answer for us is much the same as it was for the Corinthians. We, too, must focus on our shared identity, on the truths we hold in common. The beliefs and the identity we share as Christians ought to be bigger and stronger than the things that divide us. 
we ought to be more invested in our identity in Christ than we are to country or political party. We have to show that to one another, and we have to show it to the world outside our walls. We live in a very divided society, but it is no more divided than the world that Jesus was born into. That was the same world in which Paul founded the congregation at Corinth and Ephesus and Colossae and Philippi. He did that in a world that was either indifferent or completely hostile to the Christian message. And yet, he succeeded. It can be done. We're not going to fix all the problems in the world today or tomorrow. Yet this is the work of reconciliation to which Christ calls us. And the Apostle Paul reminds us. Over the last 15 months or so, we have been separated from one another physically. Now it's time to come back together and affirm and celebrate what we have in common. Baptism is the best reminder of all we hold dear, all we hold in common. Baptism is the sign and seal of being in relationship with God, of being raised with Christ. As Paul says, we know the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring you into his presence. Today, we celebrate as Elena Rose Vasquez is baptized into the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us all come together and rejoice in this. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we come to that time in the service where we lift up the joys and concerns of this congregation for one another, for the community around us, and the world at large. 
First, we lift up a number of Diane Pilla's relatives. Her brother, Don, and her sister-in-law, Pat, are both dealing with some serious health issues. Also, her cousin, Chris, recently had a brain bleed. So for all of these members of Diane's family, we ask for healing and wholeness, for peace and for the family members, their loved ones, a release from fear and anxiety. We continue to pray for those who suffer from addiction, as well as the friends and family of those who are addicted. We ask for healing of bodies, minds, and relationships. We offer continued prayers for Jennifer and Nick, Haley Anderson, Dorothy Munnery, the Snyder family, Beth Pajak, Sandra Whitehill, Helen Burke, Susan Croft, Mary Delgado, Joni Edwards, Susan Beaton, Marion Vineyard, Veronica, Bev, Jasmine, Eileen, Cindy, Ruth, Kim, Catherine, Ginny, Denise, Sharon, Charlie, Jane, and Cindy. Gracious God, we lift all these people unto your care in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, we thank you for your continued gracious stewardship of this congregation. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. We give our thanks through our talent, our time, and our treasure. Thanks be to God whose love creates us. Thanks be to God whose mercy redeems us. Thanks be to God whose grace leads us into the future. Amen. Beloved, as you depart from this place, remember that we are bound to one another through the sacrament of baptism. Remember that our identity in Christ is the most important identity that every one of us holds. Celebrate what we have in common and then go forth and be instruments of God's peace and love and reconciliation. Do not return evil for evil to any person. But know that we are all loved by God, 
and that we are all called to reflect that love to everyone we meet. Go forth and be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and let all God's children say, Amen. Thank you.